Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to talk about cellular reprogramming by synthetic biology. So basically I'm going to continue with what I was talking about in my previous video, where I told you how epigenetic editing can be achieved by using the site-specific specificity of CRISPR-Cas9 to target the complex to different regions of DNA, and combining that with the fusion of Cas9 to different epigenetic modifying domains that can add or remove methylation or acetylation groups to different histone or DNA sites, and that this has implications for gene expression. So in this video, we'll look at an alternative way in which gene expression can be modulated also by using CRISPR-Cas9, but this time, instead of modifying the epigenetic marks, this approach works by fusing Cas9 to different transcription factor domains. And so this leads to the generation of so-called synthetic transcription factors. Pretty cool. And what's even cooler is that this approach has been used to activate genes within fibroblast cells to convert them back to so-called pluripotent cells, thereby achieving cellular reprogramming, turning one cell into a different cell state, by using these CRISPR transcriptional engineering approaches. So first, I'll briefly introduce you to these tools, and then we'll talk about cellular reprogramming, why it's useful, and then how these tools were used to achieve cellular reprogramming. So as with the epigenome editing approaches, these transcriptional modifiers also work by using dead Cas9, that is, a Cas9 protein that has been mutated such that it doesn't cut DNA, but it retains the ability to get directed to DNA sites through its guide RNA DNA interaction. And so if you want to activate a gene, the sites chosen based on previous work seem to be regions near to the transcriptional start site. So that's the region of DNA that's upstream of the gene itself. And so this is the region where the transcriptional complex will assemble and then plow through the DNA sequence to actually transcribe the gene. And the reason that these CRISPR mediated approaches are more desirable than alternative protein mechanisms is due to the fact that the CRISPR Cas9 complex recognizes its sites by RNA DNA interactions, which are much easier to reprogram and to multiplex within a cell than using these protein based approaches. And so now that we've recruited Cas9, how is gene activation actually achieved? Well, as with the epigenome editing, there have been a variety of different methods developed but a lot of them seem to depend on fusing Cas9 to a protein known as VP16. And so this protein is a transcription factor taken from the herpes simplex virus. And this transcription factor can directly interact with some mammalian transcription factors and also the RNA polymerase too, which is the polymerase that carries out transcription and hence gene activation. And this is illustrated very nicely in these different figures here where you can see different alternative versions of targeted gene activation strategies. And this one called SunTag is particularly interesting because we'll come back to it a little bit later. And this is interesting because you can see there's multiple, well, multimers of VP16, which can generate more potent transcriptional activation. And so a generic term that you may come across for these different tools are CRISPR-A for CRISPR activation or CRISPR-ON for and turning gene expression on, I guess. And so the alternatives to these applications are CRISPR interferent mechanisms, ways in which you can mediate gene silencing. And so these are known as CRISPR-I. And so in a similar manner, dead Cas9 is also used, that is also targeted upstream of a gene around the transcriptional start site. But the key difference this time is that Cas9 is fused to transcriptional domains that seem to interfere with transcription. And most commonly, as you can see in this figure here, is the, the so-called CRAB domain, standing for Crupal Associated Box, is fused to Cas9. And so fusing these different domains to the dead Cas9 has been shown to reduce the transcriptional output of many genes by around 80%. But interestingly, with both the CRISPR-A and the CRISPR-I mechanisms, there always seems to be quite a bit of variability in their effect in terms of either activating or inhibiting gene expression, respectively. And so this could be due to the locus site, the gene of interest, or the cell state. And understanding these different differences and why there seems to be so much variability will really help the use of these tools in the future. And speaking of uses of these tools, we'll now take a look at how the CRISPR activation system has been used to achieve cellular reprogramming. 
And so cellular reprogramming is typically thought to define the process of converting a differentiated cell type, for example, a fibroblast cell, and converting it back to so-called pluripotent stem cells. And so these are cells that then have the capability of differentiating into different types of cells. And so the reason that cellular reprogramming is of great interest is firstly because it can help us to understand disease processes, whereby you can take uh, cells from a patient, such as blood or skin cells, which are easy to get hold of, convert them back to pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiate them into other cell types, such as neurons, that are much harder to obviously get from a patient. And you can use that to study diseases. Secondly, it's just useful to understand cellular plasticity and understand what makes a cell type a cell type. And then lastly of interest are regenerative medicine approaches, whereby cellular reprogramming could either be used for cellular replacements or by in vivo reprogramming. And I spoke about an in vivo reprogramming technique that was used in mice at the end of last year by the David Sinclair lab, whereby they were able to restore fission in old mice. And so typically the generation of these pluripotent stem cells is achieved by expressing the so-called Giamanaka factors, that are transcription factors that can alter the cell state and convert that cell back to its de-differentiated form. However, as with most things in medicine, there are two key priorities. One, that it's safe, and second, that it's efficient and well effective as well. And in the case of cellular reprogramming, it has been seen previously that it's quite an inefficient process. And part of that's due to our lack of understanding of the epigenetic changes that occur when one cell goes back to a stem cell, And along with the fact that in some of these mechanisms, not all of the cells get the same dose of these different Yamanaka factors expressed. And so there ends up being variability or, well, heterogeneity within the cellular population in terms of the cells that can actually be reprogrammed back to the pluripotent stem cell state. Anyway, that felt like a long-winded way of me trying to say that there's some interesting work being done on cellular reprogramming, but of relevance to this video is the fact that cellular reprogramming has been achieved by using these synthetic transcriptional activators. And I think that's pretty cool. And so the general theory behind these approaches is that instead of delivering the genes that encode the different transcription factors or other factors that can achieve the reprogramming, instead you supply the Cas9 complex along with the guide RNA to target them upstream of the different genes that encode these different reprogramming factors. For example, in this 2018 study, they used a variation of this CRISPR-Sontag approach to activate endogenous expression of OCT4 and SUX2, two Yamanaka factors, in mouse fibroblast cells to achieve reprogramming to pluripotency. And intriguingly, in these mouse cells, they found that just targeting SUX2 and activating SUX2 expression was sufficient to remodel the cells, since it enables the induction of other pluripotent genes and establish the pluripotency network. And so that's great news for mouse cellular reprogramming, as it seems like you can simplify the process. But what about in terms of cellular reprogramming in in human cells? Well, a study came out later in 2018 that also achieved reprogramming this time of primary human skin fibroblasts into induced pluripotent stem cells by using this CRISPR activation approach. However, for human cells, it seems at the moment that more genes are needed to be activated to achieve sufficient efficiency and establish pluripotency in human cells compared to mouse cells. And so all in all, the use of synthetic transcription factors to achieve cellular reprogramming seems like a pretty cool approach, especially if it can also simplify the process of reprogramming by exploiting the fact that multiplexing can occur in this case just by having additional guide RNAs as opposed to having multiple genes for different transcription factors added instead, as delivery approaches is still one of the major challenges in terms of cellular reprogramming, well, along with efficiency as well. And so I hope this video has given you some insights into some cool biochemistry and synthetic biology in terms of being able to have control over the regulation of gene expression, in part due to the example I gave of cellular reprogramming. So with that, I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.